A very good afternoon and a warm welcome to all our viewers. I'm Dr. Shithil from the Clinical Engagement Team here at DocPlexus. Welcome to a brand new session of the DocPlexus Master Series. Nearly all individuals who have surgery to treat diabetes, also called as metabolic surgery, show improvement in their diabetes sometimes as quickly as few days after surgery. They experience lower blood sugar levels, need less diabetic medications, and see an improvement in diabetes-related health problems. Overall, 78% of patients experience remission, thus eliminating the need of diabetes medication. To tell us more on this and discuss this further, we have with us Dr. Raman Goel and Dr. Hani Saab. So, chairing this session, Dr. Hani is an internal medicine specialist with spe special interest in treating diabetes, thyroid, and infectious disease. She also looks after endocrine and infectious disease related to pregnancy and handle all medication emergencies for the same. She has also incorporated technology like CGMS and artificial intelligence for treating diabetes patients. She is actively involved in conducting scientific meetings for doctors and health talks for various non-profit organizations and community. She is active on YouTube and Instagram to spread awareness about health-related topics. She is an active and enthusiastic member of RSSDI and various diabetic societies. She heads the scientific committee at Kachi Medicos Association and regularly conducts CMEs for general practitioners. We happily welcome you to chair this session, Dr. Savla. You may go ahead and speak a few words on the speaker for today. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. So uh, I completely appreciate today's topic. Uh, thanks to Dr. Plexus and especially to Dr. Raman Goel, sir, who has come uh, ahead to enlighten people and solve the major queries regarding this diabetes surgery. So till now, till real long time, diabetes surgery was not even there in the nomenclature. But now it has come and it is really the need of time. As we look towards the global burden, it has been doubling every year the number of people who have diabetes and number of people who have pre-diabetes are more than doubling. So if we look at India as a country, we have 77 million individuals today with diabetes and 134 are having pre-diabetes. So maybe by 2035, 2045, we are going to have a big population, a huge population who is going to have diabetes. And mostly these individuals will also be the one who are overweight and obese. So today, have looking at it as diabetes plus obesity, diabetes city, we need to treat it through medical as well as surgical way. And I'm really glad that uh, I've been given the opportunity to chair this session where Sir is going, the who is the major stalwart in this field and who is a pioneer of this uh, laparoscopic bariatric surgery. He's himself going to speak about the bariatric surgery. No, it is a diabetes surgery, the metabolic surgery, and will also gladly answer the questions for the day, which I have in my mind and which all the viewers who are there have on their mind. So let me briefly introduce the man himself, Dr. Goel. Dr. Raman Goel is a director of diabetes and bariatric surgery at our Vokhat Hospital, Bombay. He has more than 35 years of surgical experience. He is a pioneer in laparoscopic bariatric and now the diabetes surgery. A clinical researcher who has got more than 35 publications in international College of Surgeons, Edinburgh, American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, and also by the Obesity Surgery Society of India. He is very passionate towards diabetes surgery, and today he is going to talk about his experience and evidence to support the same. So over to you, sir. Right. Thank you, Dr. Savla, uh, for such a you know, wonderful introduction. And uh, also about the topic because you know there is there is so much uh, uh, apprehension about this diabetes surgery and uh, when a physician talks about it uh, one realizes that how much information has gone through in the society so today i'm going to speak about is diabetes surgery the most effective therapy for diabetes or is surgery the most effective therapy for diabetes now this may seem to be a challenging topic but the fact remains that there is enough evidence to say 
that surgery is a good option for treatment of diabetes. Obviously, uh, there are there are other options like medicines, as we know, all the medicines, lifestyle changes. So in next 15 to 20 minutes, I'll be talking about this. And then I'll be very happy to take questions because this is a this is a new concept. Uh, I I am expecting a lot of questions, and uh, I'll be happy to answer anything, even if it may seem a little inconvenient. But uh, I have no problem because ultimately people should know what whatever is available uh, scientifically. So let me share my presentation, and then I'll. So greetings from Center for Metabolic Surgery, which is at Wakard Hospital at Mumbai Central in Mumbai. And uh, as I said, I'm going to talk, is surgery the most effective therapy for diabetes? We all know that medicines have been the, the, effect, the most effective therapy for diabetes up till now. And insulin is a standard of care in patients who are not getting their sugar controlled with lifestyle changes and uh, tablets. But is surgery a, a better option in some cases? Uh, we published this journal of bariatric surgery from India. These are my disclosures. I sit on the advisory meet committee of Ethicon Endosurgery and Novo Nordis, which is a pharmaceutical company. And this is my case mix. So as you see, I do only bariatric surgeries from last 12 years, 2011, I started doing bariatric surgeries only. And I do majorly ruin by gastric bypass. And uh, this gives an idea of the kind of work we do it here at Mukard Hospital. Let me start straight away with a, with a patient we operated uh, in December. I'll call her VK. Let's call her our index patient, but uh, uh, you know, for name's sake, we'll call her VK. She is 50 year old and about it is just about 87 kgs. She is not morbidly obese. She is diabetic for six years. And look at the number of medicines she's consuming when she came to us in December. Dr. Hani Savla only managed her before surgery. So she was an amaryl glitazone as GLT2 inhibitor a carbose DPP-4 inhibitor and on insulin. And even with these seven types of medicines, her fasting sugar was 240 and postperennial sugar was 454 when she came here. And the HB1C was 15. This is the highest HB1C I have ever seen in my life, but I have seen even worse after that. But you know, she is not the only one like this. Almost 78% of diabetics within India remain uncontrolled despite all the education, information, lifestyle changes and medicines that are available to people. And we know that when we, they remain uncontrolled, they can end up with more complications. I'll come back about VK at the end of my presentation that what happened after surgery. So please remember that her HB1C was 15 and she was just about 87 kgs. Why should we do surgery for diabetes when there are better, uh, easier way of treating diabetes, like lifestyle changes, like tablets, like injections? Before we go into surgical aspect, let me, let me give you a definition which is generally not used on the medical side. What is the definition of diabetes remission? So diabetes remission has been defined in 2009 worldwide that if HB1C is below 6.5 for at least one year without any diabetes medication, then it is called partial remission. And if HB1C is below six without medicine for at least one year, then it is complete remission. So diabetes has been considered at par with, with the cancers because we know that we, there is, we don't cure this disease, we send it in remission. And this can happen only with surgery because with medicine, the primary requirement is that the, there should be no medicines for diabetes. 
So with surgery, if their HbA1c is below 6.5, it's partial. If it's below 6, then it's complete remission. I'll be using this word in, during the presentation, remission. And that's why I thought I'll clarify. Now, the purpose of surgery is to achieve better glycemic control and to avoid or delay diabetes-related complications. This is the, the primary purpose. And as the sugar gets controlled, obviously the physician treating the patient will reduce the number of medicine or stop the medicine as and when the progress happens. What happens when somebody has a metabolic surgery, what we popularly call as diabetes surgery? Now, these are international publications which show say that 80% patients will have normal fasting sugar without medication, even at one to two years after surgery. And 36% of them will continue to be in remission for 10 years. Now, this is what important is, that they will remain in HbA1c below 6.5 or below 6 without medicine for at least 10 years. One in three patients whom we will operate, which is a very big number. And not only that, it reduces diabetes related complications in this phase. So myocardial infarction reduced by about 84%. Cerebrovascular accidents reduced by 75%. Diabetes related mortality reduced by 79%. Blindness reduced by 66%. Amputation by about 86%. And heart failure reduced by 87%. Now, these are long-term follow-up data of, of patients who had these surgeries and they have been followed for 10 and 20 years and the comparatively, the benefit has been documented and is being shown here. It is like this that we know this fact that if somebody remains in remission, the microvascular complication reduced by 19%. We are talking of remission of at least 36% patient for at least 10 years. Now, there are patients who are in remission for five years, seven years, eight years. And when we talk of remission, it is that the medicines have stopped. There are patients who may need a small dose of medicine and they can still maintain their HbA1c below 6.5 and they will not fit into the definition of remission, but they will be very well controlled. Obviously, there are other benefits of a surgery, metabolic or bariatric surgery, which we all know that like hypertension is controlled in almost 20 to 40% patients, triglyceride reduced by 50 to 100 milligram, and the risk of MI reduces by 50%. So those benefits are added benefits. And because of this, there is at least 40% all-cause mortality reduction 10 years after surgery, and 56% reduction in coronary artery disease-related mortality 10 years after surgery. So, friends, it's important that we, when we are talking of a treatment modality, we don't only look at whether it's surgical or medical, we look at the benefit to the patient. And the benefit is not only about control of blood sugar, benefit is in terms of complication reduction, in terms of mortality reduction, and this leads to increased lifespan. Patients who have this surgery and if they had diabetes before surgery, they are expected to live nine years longer than if they did not have surgery. While non-diabetic non patients, if they have a bariatric surgery, they live about five years longer. So the benefit is substantially higher in diabetic patients. And that is one of the compelling reasons why this surgery is now included as part of standard of care. Why it was not there earlier? Why it is not known to be part of standard of care? We had our own publications which we published uh, in the last seven years. So if patient had, let's say, a gastric bypass and 92% of those patients who had diabetes before surgery even after three years, they will not require medicine and their HB1C is below 6.5. After five years, these diabetic patients who are 80% who are off medicine, will 64% of them will still remain in resolution. 
we had another publication of follow up of these patients at 7 years where we said that complete remission will be there even after 7 years with just a sleeve gastrectomy in 32% patients partial remission will happen in another 22 to 23% patient that means 55% of these patient between these two groups will not need medicine and they will still be hb1c below below 6.5 now there will be another 13% patients who will may need medicine but their hb1c will be below 6.5 so 68% of the patient even 7 years after surgery are maintaining their hb1c below 6.5 which is a which is a significant gain based on such publications and publications from worldwide international diabetes federation as early as 2011 and our american diabetes association in 2021 came out with these recommendations which have been published in in uh, diabetes medicine and diabetes care the surgery can be considered as an alternative treatment option in 30 to 35 bmi patient when diabetes is not adequately controlled but at the same time they said if the patient is a indian or some other ethnicity is like an african then they, it can be offered at 27.5 bmi this was recommended in 2011 by the world's top most physicians body international diabetes federation and it took another 10 year for american diabetes association to accept it and then it took another one year in december 2022 the surgical body came out with these guidelines so our guidelines started in 1991 by nih guidelines which where we were operating these patients about 35 bmi first time in last 31 years the guidelines have been modified that we can offer this surgery to 27.5 bmi asians if they have uncontrolled diabetes and that is the reason why in last 4 5 months we have been talking more more openly about this and we are offering this surgery to patients who are not even obese those patients who are just overweight by about uh, 7 to 8 kgs then even the the british guidelines the nice guidelines changed and they said if there is a person of asian origin who has diabetes for less than 10 years and a bmi of 27.5 he can avail this surgery in nhs so the 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 nhs is now offering this surgery to asian patients who's a uh, uh, type 2 diabetes which is not well controlled few important statements before we go forward one is that the, the this is a trial from cleveland clinic which says that the, this is a, the benefit of this surgery for diabetes is independent of bmi those patients whose bmi was above 35 or below 35 the impact of surgery on diabetes is similar then there is another study which which shows that the benefit is weight loss independent that glucose control is not related to amount of weight loss that means patients have glycemic control within a week of surgery even before they have lost 2 or 3 kgs so the mechanism of the surgery which i'm going to talk to you later is not because the person has lost weight but also mostly because of the hormonal changes in the gut and then there is another study though not a very strong surgery which uh, study which says that this is weight regain independent because many many people say that okay if patient will gain weight after bariatric surgery then they will have diabetes again but this particular study which is which is a small group study says that weight regain does not significantly affect diabetes resolution even 5 years after a gastric bypass so bmi independent weight loss independent and weight regain independent benefit on diabetes how exactly this surgery is done i am sure all of you have attended lectures on bariatric surgery it could be a sleeve gastrectomy a ruen y gastric bypass or a mini gastric bypass all three of them helps in diabetes control these surgeries now generally can be done in less than 1 hours time 
blood loss is less than 50 ml always done laparoscopically and usual hospital stays 24 to 48 hours how does it helps in diabetes control that is a, that's a very important and relevant discussion point so in all these surgeries the food goes this to distal ileum faster because it's not going through the stomach or the or the proximal jejunum so when the food goes into the distal ileum there is a quicker secretion of glp1 hormone and glp1 hormone which is secreted from the ileum which leads to improved insulin sensitivity and when the insulin resistance goes down the acute insulin response which we know comes back and thus they start behaving like a like a non diabetic patient they, they they start responding to food challenge like like how a non diabetic does glp1 is also responsible for enhanced insulin secretion and it is believed that they also leads to increased number of pancreatic beta cells there is another mechanism of enhanced biliary circulation uh, which helps in uh, in uh, glucose production from liver and uh, this reduces the glucose production from liver and that's how the the sugar uh, the the blood sugar gets controlled just to briefly show you pictorially that uh, how the weight loss independent mechanism works obviously there is a calorie restriction there is a change in the gut hormones the the transit time the food moves faster postprandial insulin secretion and creatine effect comes and there is a decreased hepatic glucose production so all these together work to help in glycemic control after surgery whether this benefit will last long term after after a, a metabolic surgery yes it is possible just like how we talk in bariatric surgery that if patient follows a healthy diet if they exercise they can maintain their weight long term here also if patient follows the dietary restrictions that are typically advised by the uh, diabetes educator and if they exercise regularly and we advise them to do a three monthly hb1c they they can maintain their sugar for a very very long time and the sugars are not likely to go up then the next question comes that okay we we can manage these patients with diet and lifestyle changes why should somebody have a invasive procedure like a surgery but please uh, believe the data that there are now enough publication which says that the perioperative mortality of this surgery is only 0.13% which is less than even a laparoscopic cholecystectomy which you get routinely done for gall gallstones so these surgeries have become comparatively much safer and the risk of death after this surgery is much less for patients after surgery compared to those who never had the surgery and this is not a new surgery we have been doing gastric bypasses as a bariatric procedure for almost 20 22 years now ourselves and worldwide they are being done for 60 years so we are not talking of a new surgery we are talking of an established procedure which has been studied in detail for last 60 years only the indication of the procedure has changed now what are the inclusion criteria so the currently accepted inclusion criteria is that the person should have a bmi of 27.5 which is like if he is 8 to 10 kg overweight from his ideal weight they obviously should be on medical management and hb1c should be more than 7 and they should have a good pancreatic function so you if you get a, a fasting c peptide done it should be at least one or more if these three criteria are met, patient can be offered the surgery. What are the exclusion criteria? Obviously, this surgery doesn't work in type 1 diabetes. Patient who have latent autoimmune disease of adult, so we get our anti-GAD antibodies done. If they are positive, we deny surgery. Or patients who have maturity onset diabetes of young. So if somebody comes whose, whose age is less than 30 years, it's a good idea to get these genetic tests done because if he has a Modi type of disease, then they are likely to have a, a type 1 of diabetes type of disease in future. Good thing is that 
as per bariatric surgery approval metabolic surgery is covered under insurance but at the moment these are old guidelines which says this covers for 35 bmi with uncontrolled diabetes the, the surgical guidelines changed just recently in 2022 already we are working on it maybe in a few years time uh, this this guideline and for insurance will change but even about 35 bmi there is there is a huge number of patients who can benefit for treating their diabetes so friends the proof of pudding is in the eating it i'll show you a few of the patients whom we have operated recently in last uh, four five months for uh, low bmi diabetic this is our index patient i talked to you initially whose hba1c was 15 now look at it after surgery within a week's time her fasting sugar stopped dropped from 454 to 174 then 116 and 135 while post perennial sugar dropped from 240 and till 87 at three months after surgery. Her HbA1c dropped from 15 in one month's time to 10.5 and in three months' time to 7.4. So it almost halved within a within three months of surgery. I'm sure if this trend continues at six months, this will be somewhere around six. And more than that, these were the seven medicines that she was consuming. At one month, she was only on metformin and a sulfonylurea. And at three months, she's only on a metformin. And still, her sugars are so well controlled and her HB1C is dropped down to 7.4. So that gives them, you an idea of how this works on an on a individual case basis. I'll show you there are there are there are other four patients whom we operated in December after we started doing this diabetes surgery. This gentleman whose uh, sugar levels were uh, high fasting and PP. This is this is PP sugar in red in all patients, and this is fasting sugar. And you see how the sugar graphs have gone down within three months for all these patients. I'll show you their HbA1c level. Uh, these are the this is the VK patient we talked, so we'll not talk about her. So this is 9.35, 15, 9.5, 7.3, 8.2. These were the patients before surgery. And at three months, this patient's HbA1c dropped to 8.1, VK is dropped to 7.4. This patient from 9.5 to 7.4. This patient whose HbA1c was 7.3 is 5.8. She is not on any kind of medication and from 8.2 to 6.5 so these are these are short term results i have shown you long term results which we have published and i have shown you how this works so friends diabetes surgery is an additional tool it is definitely not a substitute of medical management for patients with an aggressive or uncontrolled diabetes we need to remember how Cancer uh, specialists manage their patients with medicine, surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and each of these arm of medical management contributes to health of patients. Similarly, in cardiology, the, the cardiologist, cardiac surgeon, they work in tandem and manage patients wherever they are indicated. So to conclude, the take-home message from my side is now it's possible that the patients who are not able to control their sugar can have long-term blood sugar control. Higher remission rates are in seen in those patients who are who are coming to for surgery at an early stage. Diabetes complications can be prevented or delayed in most. Obviously, there is concomitant control of blood pressure, cholesterol, etc. There are enough studies which says that there is a 50% reduction in heart attacks or uh, strokes. There are reduced diabetes-related deaths and longer lifespan. So thank you so much, Doc Plexus, for inviting me for this uh, program. If you want any more for any further information, please feel free to contact us, and our team will be happy to share uh, more details to you or uh, 
So thank you so much. And uh, I'll be very happy to take questions. Dr. Hani Savla is a, a senior physician in our hospital who manages many of our patients uh, before surgery and after surgery. And so her experience in this field is invaluable uh, as a physician. And Dr. Hani, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. And if there are any questions from the audience, uh, please feel free to take them. Yeah. So we have many questions as it is uh, something which is recent and something which is, uh, I mean, there is a lot of enthusiasm to know more about this. So let me start one question from the audience, though I have my own questions also to be asked. So the first thing uh, someone from the our viewers have asked, what are the things that a patient needs to do post-surgery surgery to avoid reoccurrence of diabetes? I think uh, I mentioned this. So one is that uh, they must continue to follow the dietary restrictions, diabetes-related dietary restrictions. So patients come and say, now you are all operating, so can I eat sweets every day? Now this surgery does not give you a license to to eat wrong things or unhealthy things. You are getting a surgery done to be much healthier. And so if you follow the dietary restrictions, and obviously we all know that if somebody is exercising regularly, the insulin resistance remains less. So if they are also exercising at the same time, so I think these two are main issues that, uh, that should be followed. And uh, uh, regular, maybe three monthly or six monthly checkup of blood sugar, HbA1c, so that you should not remain undiagnosed diabetic in case the sugar goes up. But as I said, in majority of the patients that remain under control, and um, this is the way one can one can manage it even long long for longer duration. Agree, totally agreed, sir. Uh, question which I want to ask in busy uh, you know behalf of all physicians actually. At what stage of diabetes treatment you are looking for us to refer a patient to you? Only when they are on insulin, or even before that, or just the inclusion criteria, just the criteria which you mentioned actually. So I think. Uh, this is a very important question because uh, uh, this was asked by a patient also to me that I am on oral hypoglycemics. Do I need to take insulin before you decide whether yeah, I should go for surgery or not? So, you know, there are, you have those ADA guidelines about level of uh, medical management. So if you are, if you are managing a patient at a certain level, and the, the, the sugars are not well controlled. And even with the addition of the next level of medicines, if the sugars are not getting controlled, it's a good idea to send the patient for surgery if they meet those basic requirements. I put it the, in another way. If there is a history of an aggressive diabetes in a family, if a patient comes and you find out that his father died of a myocardial infarction at the age of 55 years after diabetes for five years or 10 years, if somebody had a stroke in the family and or somebody has a diabetic nephropathy and required the dialysis early at an early age, these are the patients who are better candidates because as we physicians know it better than us, there are patients who are who remain very well controlled on one or two pills a day for 20 years. And there are patients who go rapidly on insulin within three to four years because they have a aggressive kind of diabetes. So I think if I'm talking to physician, patients with severe insulin resistant diabetes are the best candidates for surgery. Patients who are severe immune deficient diabetes are not that great candidates for diabetes. But this is, this you know how to evaluate. Evaluate this, find out their HOMA index, find out their C-peptide levels, their pancreatic function, and you know those four criteria, five, five, five criteria of diabetes now. So best results are seen in those who have severe insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is what the surgery targets. Right, right, sir. Uh, sir, can you uh, quote any study where cancer-related improvements or like a decrease in the incidence of cancer has been seen after this surgeries? Uh, I know diabetes is very recent, but bariatric surgery and its outcome was also diabetes control. So during that experience, 
Yeah. Uh, you can coat anything where cancer also has so been. So there are there are significant benefits, and there are many publications which say that the cancer-related risk reduced significantly. I have not put many things in this presentation. Um, simply the reason is that when I make all these presentations, sometimes I feel I'm I'm like a quack, just selling a powder on the street, which says that this can benefit this, 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 and suddenly I feel what I'm doing. But the fact remains that with this surgery, the cancer-related risk reduces significantly. I have uh, I have an entire presentation on that, and. Uh, uh, needless to say, it reduces the because the the insulin related growth factors are an important contributor to malignancy. And when we have those, I when there's a reduction of IGF, uh, mm -hmm. that that helps in uh, uh, that helps in the in the reduction of malignancies. But you know, I can't quote the study offhand, but uh, there, there is enough data on that. Yes. Yes. Uh, one more question from uh, viewers is that are there cases in which diabetes reversal has not been successful? Please do quote the failure rate if you have and what could be the possible reason? Okay. So see, we are not doing diabetes reversal. We are simply saying that the blood glucose levels will remain under control. Now, blood glucose remains level remain under control in almost all the patients, number one. Now, those patients where medicine stops, they are they are qualified as remission patients. So if you are looking only as control, it happens in almost every patient. Now remission is when all the medicines stop for at least one year. Okay, so when you say that which are the patients where the results have not been good, and so patients who are on long term insulin patients who are diabetic for more than 10 years may not go in remission, may not stop all the medicines, but that is not important. The important thing is all of them will maintain their HB1C below 7, like our index patient VK. She was taking 7 types of medicines and still HB1C 15. In 3 months, she is 7.4 and just one medicine that is metformin. Now, is she a successful candidate or is she a failure candidate? At the moment, by remission definition, she is still is an unsuccessful candidate. But as far as she is concerned, or Dr. Honey is concerned, or I am concerned, who are treating her, we know that she is she is achieving excellent results. So I think patients who are coming early have, have higher possibility of remission. Patients who are coming late will have still a good control, but they may not have remission. I think, sir, this is an excellent point that early is now the criteria. The criteria has been revised because of this early, because every time we consider surgeries as a last or late option. But I think considering it early will have a definitely better advantage to control the micro and the macrovascular complications. So I think the whole idea should be that people should understand when to refer early. Yeah. So, Dr. Honey, I mentioned this when I was, this is not applicable in India, but the British guideline says, that patient who have diabetes for less than 10 years. So right. they are offering free surgery to them in NHS. Right. Now imagine this, how big a statement is this? Because here we are mostly getting patients who have diabetes for 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. So that means that the results are better. So we say if diabetes is less than 10 years and if you're on insulin for less than four years, the results are much better. Agreed. Uh, one more question that what would be the surgeon or physician's responsibility post-surgery for a successful weight loss regimen? Okay. So uh, the, the, the thing is that these surgeries are primary, they were primarily designed for weight loss. For the last 60 years, these surgeries were used only for weight loss. Now there are two types of patients we are dealing. We are dealing patients who are obese and diabetic. We are dealing patients who are just overweight and they have they are primarily coming to us for diabetes. So we have different types of protocol for them. Those who are obese and diabetic or morbidly obese and diabetic, they continue to be followed as bariatric patients <coughs> where the focus remains besides diabetes control on weight loss. But the patients who are 
who got recently added in our operating list for last four to five months are those who are under 30 BMI who are just eight, nine, 10 kg overweight. Here, the protocols have been completely revised and our team has worked for weeks together to change the follow-up protocols so that they do not lose weight. So there are one group of patients where weight loss is emphasized by restricting their calorie intake, by restricting their fat and carbohydrate intake. There's another group of patients where calorie restriction is not a problem. Their fat restriction is not a problem, but the carbohydrate restriction is a problem because they're diabetic and they're just overweight. So we have different sets of follow protocol and our uh, team uh, follows those patients. So the major emphasis is that uh, diet and lifestyle changes should continue in spite of the surgery. It, there is no liberty of just consuming anything that they want just because they have got operated. I think that's a part of life in any case. You know, when somebody has a cardiac bypass surgery, does he st start eating fried food from next day? I mean, rather the other way, they are told to exercise regularly, eat healthy. When there's somebody has a knee joint surgery, knee replacement surgery, they are still told to lose weight. So I think there is no alternative to lifestyle chain. That's the, the foundation of diabetes management. Uh, I don't know where the slide got missed, but for two, for the, the entire humankind for last five to 6,000 years, patients were only managed by lifestyle when diabetes was there. 1921, as you remember, insulin got invented. Mm. And then other medicines came. Only for last 100 years, we have been using allopathic medicines. So lifestyle change will remain in these patients. Some patients will also need medicine. And many patients may not need those also if they have a surgery. So, so these are now three components, but they are not uh, this or that. All of them together to help the patient have a better and healthy life. Right. Agreed, sir. So one question from the viewer that patient has already developed complications like neuropathy or nephropathy. Uh, should they be suggested the surgery or like is the surgery going to help them? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a difficult question, primarily because some of these complications become autonomous. Now my, my nephrology friends tell me that diabetic nephropathy become an autonomous disease, irrespective of glycemic control. So even if you, once the nephropathy has settled in, even if you control the sugar, nephropathy goes on its own tangent and that continues. Will I offer it? Of course, I'll offer this surgery for, for more than one reason. It's not a question of one complication, if I can avoid. So like microvascular complications also include retinopathy. So if somebody has nephropathy but has no retinopathy, maybe we can avoid that or delay that. We can avoid macrovascular complication. Or we don't know, we can probably avoid progression of nephropathy. We are hopefully starting a clinical trial very soon from next month where we are studying only diabetic nephropathy in these patients, whether mm -hmm. those patients with nephropathy, how they will uh, behave in long term for next three to five years after surgery. But there is published data which says that nephropathy improves, my albuminuria reduces, uh, creatinine uh, levels reduce after, after metabolic surgery. So I think uh, it's on an individual case-to-case -case basis in established uh, complication patients, but uh, certainly it, it has to be offered. Um. Yeah, the viewers also want to know that how risky is the surgery and what are the complications that can occur after the diabetes surgery, which a surgeon also has to be careful about. All right. Surgeon is most careful about complications because, you know, our entire lives, uh, our career depends on it. The complication wise, these surgeries can have two types of things. One is acute complication, one long term side effects. Now, acute complications are extremely rare. As I mentioned, the perioperative mortality is 0.13%. That means one in 1,000 patients. When we are dealing with patients who had CABGs, when we are dealing with patients who are on dialysis, when we are dealing with patients who had a stroke earlier or a pulmonary embolism earlier. So we are dealing with a very a wide spectrum of high-risk patients who are coming to us for surgery. Besides, 
uh, normal diabetics who don't have this kind of risk factor. So surgical risk is comparatively much less than the risk of disease. Long term side effects are more related to uh, uh, limiting the food quantity and limiting the nutrition intake. Now, since these studies have been studied for are being used for 60 years, scientifically, we know what supplements they need. They need a multivitamin, calcium, iron supplement on a regular basis. And fortunately, now those supplements are available as, as a single dose supplement manufactured in India. And patient takes one capsule a day and they don't need to take any more vitamins or calcium separately. So, so there are uh, ways and means that this um, so these uh, side effects uh, can only happen if patient is non-compliant. In a compliant patients, they are not seen. Okay. Understood, sir. So just an extension to this, I already explained, what are the medications one has to take after the diabetes surgery? So I think the question is about the OHA as well as the supplements which you Excellent. told. Excellent. I think, I think supplements are very specific. You would... Sorry, go ahead, please. No, no. So I think they want to know from both point of view, like yeah. diabetic treatment also post-surgery as well as the supplements. Yeah. So supplements I have already explained. These are the three broad groups, B12, multivitamin, iron and calcium. Three, four, and they can be taken together uh, as, a, as a single dose. Now, as far as diabetic medications are concerned, so since we are already doing uh, a surgery which uh, which uh, which uh, accelerates production of GLP-1. So you don't need to give GLP-1 receptor agonist. We also know that these patients, if you are put on insulin to control the sugar, their control gets delayed. So typically we, we suggest our physician colleagues, please use biguanides, sulfonylureas, and if necessary, SGLT2 inhibitor. These three groups. Uh, and as you can see in the, in the, the patients that I have shown, most of them end up with the metformin. And these are also we are giving because we are, this is early stage because most of the centers internationally stop metformin also very early. But these are our difficult patients. And then we titrate them uh, with blood sugar level and gradually re reduce metformin also. So primarily these three groups, uh, you know, uh, we have to be very careful about sulfonylurea so that they don't go into hypoglycemia, uh, which is obviously a risk in when, whenever sulfonylureas are being used. Uh, so there's one more question, which I think is in relevance to the PubMed article also, that do we see any alterations in the gut mi microbiome after this surgery? Yes, there has been a lot of excitement about gut microbiota. And suddenly everybody thought that you know, we can have fecal capsules, we can have cultured medicines and we can, but uh, I think the, the excitement has got tempered down uh, because uh, it has been realized that uh, the, 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 it is not very uniform. And um, I, don't, I, will, I don't give much importance to change in gut microbiota anymore. There is a bigger implication of uh, enterobiliary circulation which causes these, uh, uh, which causes glycemic control, which helps in glycemic control. So gut microbiota does change, does change for healthy. Uh, we can have healthy, we have healthy microbiota after surgery, but whether that is singularly responsible for glycemic control, not really. Okay, got it, sir. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask you personally this question that uh, how do you choose which surgery you will like to do in your diabetic, especially I'm talking about this metabolic surgery only, not the bariatric, that whether you want to go for gastric bypass or sleeve gastrectomy, how do you decide at uh, looking at the patient? It's only the BMI? No, BMI is never a criteria in my practice. Mm -hmm. uh, patients get, um, this decision is taken based on non-BMI criteria. So, uh, it has been seen that sleeve gastrectomy uh, uh, can cause enhanced uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Mm -hmm. So patients who already have symptoms of dyspepsia or acid peptic disease or GERD, 
uh, we try to avoid doing sleep. So we do gastric bypass. Now patients who do not have GERD or aseptic disease, we can offer them sleep. Another criteria at the moment, as far as metabolic surgery is concerned, both have similar results in first five to six years. But after five to six years, glycemic control is seen better in gastric bypass than in sleep. So we try to offer gastric bypass to all metabolic patients at the moment because we want them to have better results in long run also. Uh, so these are big, primarily two reasons, uh, two ways of looking at it. Yeah. And uh, sir, most important question, can you tell the cost of the surgery as compared to the medical management? Okay. This question must be from you, Dr. Honey. You don't want yes. us to operate. No, no. I want everyone to take an <laughs> open opinion about operation. I agree. That's I agree. <laughs> so there are two ways of looking at it. Obviously, surgery upfront will be much more expensive than the medical management because medical management, you buy medicines for seven or 10 days and, uh, and the cost gets distributed. But with the newer medication that are coming, you know, which are, which are considered like GLP-1 receptor agonist and all, the cost of treatment, medical management, like how my patients tell me, uh, uh, is between 10 to 20,000 rupees a month. The, the surgical cost, one-time cost, can match the medical management within one and a half to two years. And as I said, most of the patients are uh, covered under insurance because a good number of them are about 35 BMI at the moment. So they don't pay anything. They, they are doing it through cashless route. So surgical cost can vary depending on which procedure we are doing, which class we are doing. But if you look at the overall benefit, not only the, the treatment cost of diabetes, but avoiding diabetes related complications, uh, it, it's actually practically nothing. That's why something like NICE, the NHS is now ready to offer this surgery. Insurance companies in India are also paying for this surgery while they don't pay you for to going to a gym or to go to a dietitian because they have scientifically analyzed, statistically analyzed that the surgery works better in long run for the health of the insurance companies. <laughs> true, true, true. Agreed, sir. So that may be one of the reason, but I think more and more insurance companies should now take this uh, up and they should cover the surgery so that eventually the micro and microvascular complications when they go down, the burden of uh, in healthcare in our country at least reduces. That's right. Absolutely. I think it's a, it's a major thing. We are raising it right till the level of the government of India uh, mm -hmm. that uh, this must be incorporated because, you know, we have so much uh, pool of surgeons, medical colleges, where this surgery can be even offered free of charge to patients if once it becomes a standard of care and yeah. the poorer people who are losing their uh, toes and feet of by amputation for diabetic ne neuronephropathy can, uh, can still remain in a workforce of the country. I think it's just a matter of time as awareness gets created and mm -hmm. it gets accepted. That uh, It's not a question of how much they pay at Wokard Hospital. It's a question of across the board, there are various levels of healthcare available in this country and it, uh, people can benefit from that. Agreed, agreed, sir. So I am sure you have already spoken about this, but just to get still more brief idea and colorful idea actually about your, uh, actually how confident you are about the outcome of this surgery in long run. Okay, so I'll, I'll answer it like this. One thing is when we manage patients medically and we say your sugars are under control, your complications reduce by 19%. Here we are talking of sugar control. There is a study called Swedish Obese Subjects Study, which says even after 10 years, 84% patients have their glycemic control. That means 10 into 19%, they will not have microvascular complications. This is statistics. Science is all statistics. It's not WhatsApp messages or, uh, or uh, Instagram posts. It's a question of what is the data? How reliable is data? And how do we how do we accept it? Is there anything contradictory to the data? So in majority of the patients, the results are excellent. If that is there, 
I am absolutely confident. Five of my own family members have undergone this surgery, not only for diabetes but for obesity and diabetes both. And if I can operate on my own family members to do this surgery, uh, there can't be a bigger conviction about this. Agreed. Totally true. Totally true, sir. So, last uh, question is uh, something I I didn't get actually. What this viewer wants to ask? He wants to ask that uh, when should we enroll for the insurance? But I think. Uh, this you have already spoken about the insurance, right? Already, which patients should enroll for the insurance is the question. No, I think what they are asking is that when, um, so typically it is said that any pre-existing disease in insurance uh, it doesn't, uh, is not called a pre-existing disease after four years of insurance. Hmm. So similarly for obesity and diabetes also, if you have this disease, you must take insurance early, enroll in insurance. I believe that's what you're saying. So exactly. that after four years, you are entitled to get the surgery done, no question asked. Uh, so this one question just came to my mind because one of my patients had asked me once that whatever criteria we have mentioned, we have told age more than 18 years, right, sir, everywhere. So for childhood obesity, juvenile obesity, is anyone doing the surgery right now or is it anywhere uh, going to happen in future or how is it? Okay. Uh, all right, I'll tell you one thing. So type 1 diabetes or juvenile diabetes, this surgery does not have uh, any, any significant role. Yes, it's but no obesity, the, only obesity related, I'm asking. Yeah, if child is obese, then obviously the surgery can be offered. And if they also have type 1 diabetes, they will have much better control. But I cannot offer this surgery at 27.5 BMI for a type 1 diabetes child. So children can be offered this surgery as a bariatric surgery above 35 and 40 BMI. Mm -hmm. The criteria are a little higher for children and uh, uh, they definitely benefit. Nobody offers it for type 1 diabetes in adults. Agreed, agreed. Yes. Okay, so that is a very nice point. For type 1 obese uh, children, we can at least... Uh, Absolutely, visit, uh, we, can, we can do it, yes. This is a real eye-opener. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, sir, that how many people in India currently are doing this metabolic surgery? So it is like this. We, about 500 surgeons across the country do bariatric surgeries. And most of them are operating on 35 BMI and above. Very few surgeons have started doing on 27.5 BMI uh, because these guidelines changed just about four months back. And they, we all need to change our protocol. I've been appealing to them that they must start doing these surgeries, change their protocols so that they, they include low BMI patients. So I think it's it's just a beginning, Dr. Honey. Uh, the, the, the issue is, uh, it's just a matter of time that all over the country, as the patients and physicians get aware, and as they start referring patients for surgery, um, um, uh, at the moment, at 27.5 BMI, even in most of the metro cities, surgeons are not operating. But it's just a matter of time. Okay. Interesting. I think it was a real enlightening uh, webinar and we got a lot of uh, ideas and a lot of doubts were clarified. My doubts were also clarified during this session, sir. So thank you so much. But I would like to ask you that any closing message you want to go? We are right at 4 o'clock. Okay. So I think my closing message is one should live healthy. One should not get carried away by the, the messaging that is coming through the social media. There is enough science behind what is being offered by physicians in terms of medicine, by surgeons, by dietitians. So follow the advice of qualified people. You cannot let your diabetes ruin your career or you're bonding with your children because uh, you end up with a, on a on a wheelchair or, or working on a crutch because you had a stroke early. There are no ways and means of controlling diabetes early and living a healthier life. And so please eat healthy, exercise regularly. These are the lifestyle changes that we keep talking about. If you do that, you can keep away from Dr. Honey and Dr. Ramin Goyal. But if that doesn't help in blood sugar control, do not hesitate to go to your nearest physician in whichever city you are and uh, take his advice. And if sugars are still not controlled, think up of surgery. Don't get 
is scared because of surgery or because of the cost because your life is much more costly and much more valuable than that absolutely very well said sir i think that's the very well uh, point taken and very nicely said that don't miss on the follow up also after the surgery absolutely. we should not take the liberty of missing and not investigating ourselves any more after the surgery thank you so much sir uh, it was really really uh, enlightening talk and i'll hand over to shitil to give the last uh, closing remarks uh, thank you so much uh, dr raman and uh, uh, dr hani as well for this enlightening session so this brings us to the end of this session thank you so much uh, doctors for your time and effort in putting together uh, this interesting session to our dear viewers thank you so much for attending this session do share any more questions if you have until we see you again take care and happy doplexing thank you thank you dr hani thanks shithil and the entire doplexers team thank you very much thank you, thank you everyone bye bye bye